Hello, welcome to the ANA highlight series on neurogenetics. This is the subgroup topic on the ethics of neurogenetics. And uh, today I'm happy to welcome uh, Kate Spector Baghdadi, um, who is a JD with a master's in bioethics um, and an assistant professor of obstetrics and gynecology uh, and interim co director at the Center for Bioethics and Social Sciences and Medicine at the University of Michigan Medical School. Um, at Michigan, uh, uh, she uh, teaches the responsible conduct of research as well as research ethics and the law and is an associate editor of the American Journal of Bioethics. And the overarching goal of Professor Spector's work is improving the governance of secondary research with health data and specimens um, with particular questions and concerns related to under uh, uh, historically excluded groups. Uh, prior to joining Michigan, uh, Professor Spector was an associate director for President Obama's Presidential Commission for the Study of Bioethical Issues and an FDA law attorney. She received her law degree from the University of Pennsylvania Law School and her bioethics degree from Penn School of Medicine. Um, Professor uh, Spector Baghdadi, thank you for joining us today. Yeah, and thanks for having me, Dr. Todd. I think this is a really important topic and I'm glad to be here. Um, so as you mentioned, I thought I'd talk with us for a few minutes today about precision medicine and specifically the topic of engaging and supporting our historically excluded patients. This is a topic that I've been interested in for quite some time. Um, as Dr. Todd mentioned, uh, my previous job was, I was Associate Director for President Obama's Bioethics Commission for five years. And launching the Precision Medicine Initiative under the White House at that time, as well as the Cancer Moonshot Initiative, was one of President Obama's major priorities. So the goal of the Precision Medicine Initiative and now Precision Medicine programs across the country at different hospitals is really this ideal that we'll be able to take genetic information, environmental information, health behavior information, and actually be able to tailor predicted health outcomes at an individual level, right? So you'll no longer have to go to your doctor and have that doctor say, well, we think you have a 40% chance of surviving. Like the goal is that we'll be able to tell our patients for somebody your age with some of your de demographics, with some of your other comorbidities, like this is what we really think was the best decision for you. So that's the overarching goal of precision medicine, and it sounds pretty great. One of the challenges that we're definitely still grappling with, both in the US and globally, is the fact that these massive data banks and health information archives are not representative of our patient populations. So this is a snapshot from 2016 that was published in Nature of genome-wide association study databases worldwide. So this is globally. And as you can see from this image here, um, the vast majority of people who are represented in those databases are of European ancestry. And the majority of the rest of them are of Asian ancestry. And when we look to people of African ancestry, mixed ancestry, Hispanic, Pacific, Pacific Islander, Arab and Middle Eastern or other native populations, that's less than 5% of our global databases. And this is true even in the US at the NIH level, um, a recent study of NHGRI, that's the Genetics Institute at NIH, their GWAS catalog, only 4% of participants represented there were non-European or Asian. So it's an overarching issue. And there are different things that cause this problem at the micro level. So first, as we all know, there are lots of disparities in access to clinical care and diagnostic testing. And if patients don't have access to a doctor or to a hospital or can afford the health insurance to cover diagnostic testing, they don't end up in those databases to begin with. But the second and third are the ones that I wanna focus on for a second, um, because there are ones that there's a little bit more of control of possibly at the individual clinician and hospital level. One is disparities in people who are recruited to enroll in these databases, 
on which we base our patient tests off of. And then there are differences in the people who consent to being part of these databases. And I don't call that a disparity, right? Because that's people choosing whether or not they wanna consent. So that's a difference, but that difference can cause future disparities in um, the findings we're, be able, we're able to use with our research and the populations that that research will able to be generalized to. So here's a quick example from Michigan Medicine. And you know we studied Michigan Medicine because I happen to be here, but know that this is representative of almost all hospital systems across the country, is this sort of inherent tension between certainly wanting to ask patients to consent to be part of these databases on which to base research, so respecting their autonomy, but this also potential conflict with justice and the generalizability of the communities to whom our findings will apply. And so this is a recent example um, of an assessment we did comparing all Michigan medicine patients to those um, that met our recruitment criteria to be part of our Michigan Genomics Initiative database. And as you can see, Michigan Medicine has a largely white patient population, over 70%. However, then if we look at our MGI data bank, you can see almost 80% of those patients are white. So that's in comparison to our baseline population. So there's this sort of inherent tension of wanting to ask people and make sure that they know they're in our databases, but also trying to encourage generalizability for research. There are also, as I mentioned, differences in the people who consent to be part of those databases. And at least in this study, what we found was that our Black or African American, Asian, and Hispanic patients were almost twice as likely to decline as our white patients to enroll in our data bank once they were asked. There are some important implications for doctors when they're ordering clinical testing for their patients of the differences and disparities in these reference data sets. I'll talk about three main ones. One is an increase in variance of own unknown significance. If you order a genetic test that doesn't have the right representation for your patient's ancestral background or other kinds of demographics, and we know that variants of unknown significance are much higher in our Asian, Hispanic, Ashkenazi, Jewish, Native American, and African-American patients as compared to white patients. As an example, we know a lot about what the three variants on the BRCA gene mean for Ashkenazi Jewish women, but not as much about what that means for African-American women. This can also result in incorrect results for our underrepresented patients. As an example that was published in 2016, um, there were multiple African patients in this case study that received positive hypertrophic cardiomyopathy reports due to variants that had been misclassified as pathogenetic because they had been classified in a European population. And the last point is that this is actually bad for everybody, right? So a lack of justice, I would argue, is of course bad for everyone, but also we know that there's a huge amount of genetic diversity in our patients of African ancestry and a lack of inclusion of patients of African ancestry actually can limit research results for us all. So in summary, just a few points that I hope that you can take home from today are one, there are lots of promising advances in precision medicine. You know, it's, it's well worth the hype. It's something that we can aspire towards. However, currently, a lack of ancestral diversity in our reference databases, so those databases that we're sending those clinical tests to, can have really important impact on our patients, including additional variants or of unknown significance or incorrect results for our patients who are historically excluded from those databases. And these are key things to take into consideration before we perform those clinical genetic tests for patients who have been historically excluded. Know something about the database that these tests are going to. Where is the test being sent? What kinds of diversity do those databases represent? And are there other options? Are there other places you can send that test 
where you might be less likely to get a variant of unknown significance or incorrect results. And if you know you can't access the kinds of data you'll need to return actionable results to your patients, ask that before you order the test, as opposed to when you're sitting there with a piece of paper that just says, we don't know what's happening and, and whether that's worth that journey for the patient as well as that expenditure. So these are just the kinds of things that I would argue that we should take into consideration through that entire journey. Thank you. Great, thank you for that talk, Kate. Um, so I have a couple questions. So the first yeah. is that, as you pointed out, we there uh, some of the differences that happen in terms of um, uh, of the number of people that get involved in these larger studies that give us the information to make informed decisions for them. Uh, there's real aspects of a decreased willingness to participate in addition to the decreased recruitment. So I agree that it, you know, I, I'm wondering what you might suggest we do to overcome some of what maybe is a lack of trust among those communities uh, that's driving that, or is, is that what you think is driving it? What, what kinds of, how can we repair this? Yeah, I mean, so I don't have to speculate because there's been a lot of interesting research in this space trying to drive at what compounds these differences in consent. And yes, a lack of trust, um, a lack of trustworthiness, and ongoing discriminatory experiences are what really drive these choices. It's hard to build trust, right? It's hard to build trust and trust doesn't scale. If you build trust with one patient, you've built trust with one patient. And that's actually one of the reasons that I recommend that one of the more practical things that we can focus on is our recruitment, right? That's something we have a lot of control over. And one of the challenges with the way that we had originally designed the Michigan Medicine MGI cohort is that it had recruited um, before patients were going into the operative, operating room in the perioperative space. And the reason that it had been designed that way is because it doesn't interfere with clinical workflow. Patients are sitting there and have plenty of time to have those in-depth conversations about what they're consenting to. And they're already contributing specimens, which seem like a win-win-win. But of course, in retrospect, the parents who are sitting in our, the patients who are sitting in our pre-op space were more likely to be older white men. And that's because that's the population at Michigan Medicine who's more likely to have insurance and being waiting for elective surgeries. So with that information, Michigan Medicine was able to redesign its MGI recruitment metrics. And now actually any patient can be re recruited and we can send back and forth spit samples and we can do a lot of this online. So that has already uh, generated some increased diversity among historically excluded communities. So I think it's very hard to change individual patients' choice, especially when that lack of trust is well-deserved. But things like recruitment design is something we have a lot of control over. Right. So there are some um, efforts, some like all of us you mentioned, but also efforts to try and improve whole genome sequencing in, in some of these populations, even within Africa in particular. Um, do you do you think that those things are going to help overcome some of these uh, aspects of barriers that are currently in existing, or do you think it's going to take uh, a long time to get appropriately caught up so that the databases are really representative of the populations we care for? Yeah, that's an important question, and I'm glad you brought it up. Um, so all of us, I think, is an excellent example, and all of us is the clinical and specimen bank associated with the Precision Medicine Initiative at the federal level. And all of us's goal was to have a huge amount of historically excluded populations to ensure that this kind of research can be done. So I think at the moment, all of us has about 350,000 fully enrolled participants, which is great. And 80% of that population is historically excluded from research, which is great. One challenge they continue to face is that many of those enrollees are historically excluded in different ways, right? And so if we're conducting genetics research, what we really want are 100,000 um, Black men over the age of 60 with cardiac disease and diabetes. 
in order to do sort of the, the ingrain, the nitty gritty kind of genetics research that one needs to do to try to isolate variants that are associated with health outcomes. But unfortunately, that's just not what the databases have currently because they have such um, a heterogeneity within the historically excluded population. So it's something that we very much have to continue working towards. So a few months ago, you and I had a chance to host a, a movie showing, the movie Gattaca, which is a, a movie about basically genetics uh, choices being made at the embryonic stage. Um, leading to differences societally that lead to socioeconomic barriers for those who are genetically not getting the same evaluation. So I, I know I kind of wonder a little bit, uh, we're not at a Gattaca world quite yet, um, but we are closer than I think we had been when the movie was made 20 years ago by a fair bit. So, um, you know, what do you just speak to the potential for how we, we might worry about uh, if these genetic discrepancies are not appropriately corrected, that we might actually lead to greater exacerbation of the already existing differences among populations and how we can avoid that? Because that, that's something I'm, I worry a lot about. Yeah, um, and, and Gattaca is an, was really a well-done movie, not only because it's a lot of fun and not only because of Ethan Hawke, but because it really sort of brought up a lot of different kinds of questions that still really are very salient today. Um, certainly one of them is you know, the pre-implementation implementation genetic diagnosis, right? And sort of what it is that people should be allowed to test for in that space. Um, that's certainly an ongoing issue. I was actually just, I was just listening to a talk, la you know, last hour about this. And it's really interesting. Um, ongoing studies have found that prospective parents are very much still interested in that kind of testing. They're interested in testing for intelligence. They're in interested in testing for height. They're interested in testing for other phenotypic variation. So the interest is out there. Um, I think that it is probably going to end up to be less of a problem than was sort of speculated in Gattaca, just because it's so expensive. Like, People are not going to be able to afford this kind of testing at a meta level, right? Um, I think we discussed this when we were talking about Gattaca last time, but it's hard to believe that the old fashioned way of making a baby is gonna go anywhere anytime soon. This like concept that all babies are gonna be done through IVF. But it continues to be a concern that for those who are and for the parents who can afford it, that they might be able to give their children even more advantages than average. However, we also know that there are all sorts of advantages that um, privileged children get that others don't, like SAT prep, like parents who help them with their homework. And so it's not clear that, I, that we can eradicate either or either is gonna be a hugely reach out over the other one. Yeah, right. So. That's certainly the hope, uh, you know, that we won't run into the barriers that we, that we won't create a new set of barriers, but I do worry it could play some role in the things going forward. And I, in some ways we won't know for a couple more decades, um, but I, I would rather be protective uh, rather than um, assuming it will all work out, I think. In, in, in the past, every time we've assumed it's going to work out, it hasn't always done so. So yeah, and certainly ethicists are not big into assuming everything is going to work out. <laughs> I guess I guess my point was less like I think everything's going to work out, and more we have bigger problems right now because we know that our research isn't currently generalizable to populations who have been historically the most vulnerable and historically the least likely to be able to access healthcare to begin with, and that to me is sort of the real problem of genetic discrimination at the moment. Right. Well, thank you very much for your time today. Uh, it was really uh, helpful and insightful uh, talk and um, thanks. Yeah, that was fun. Thanks for having me, Dr. Todd.